Folcherov, Galera, good afternoon. My name is Barry Colfer, and I'm the Director of Research here at the Institute of International and European Affairs in Dublin. I'm really delighted to welcome you to today's meeting, the fourth presentation in our Environmental Resilience Lecture Series, which the IIA is thrilled to organize in conjunction with the Environmental Protection Agency, the EPA. I'd like to take this opportunity uh, to thank the EPA as ever for their sponsorship of this series and for their ongoing support of the Institute and its work. And this has been a really great series thus far, and uh, it's great to see you all here in such great numbers. We're delighted to be joined today by Professor Kate Rayworth, an ecological economist and co-founder of Donut Economics Action Lab. Thanks to Kate and team for being available to spare the time to be with us. By way of a brief introduction, Kate Rayworth is an ecological economist and is the founder of Donut Economic Actions Lab. Kate is an internationally best-selling author of Donut Economics, Seven Ways to Think Like a 21st Century Economist, which has been translated into over 20 languages and has been widely influential and has been cited by diverse audiences ranging from the UN General Assembly, Pope Francis and Extinction Rebellion. Kate is also a senior associate at Oxford University's Environmental Change Institute, where she teaches in the Masters in Environmental Change and Management, those lucky students. Kate is also a professor of practice at Amsterdam University of Applied Sciences. Over the past 25 years, Kate's career has taken her from working with micro-entrepreneurs in villages in Zanzibar to co-authoring the Human Development Report for the UNDP in New York followed by a decade as senior, a senior researcher at Oxfam. So really diverse and really interesting background. Today, Kate will present the donut of social and ecological boundaries, and will give something of an overview of the transformations that are required for the donut to take shape. Kate will also focus in part on the need for regenerative and distributive dynamics, particularly in the context of cities, towns, and regions and we'll highlight some examples of local governments and community organizations around the world that are starting to put these ideas into practice. Kate will speak to us for about 20 minutes or so, and then as ever, we'll go to the questions and answers with you, our audience. As ever, you'll be able to join the discussion using the Q&A function on Zoom, which you should be able to see on your screen. Please feel free to send your questions in throughout the session as they occur to you, and we'll get to as many questions as we can once Kate has finished her presentation. A reminder that today's presentation and Q&A are both on the record. Please feel free to join the discussion on Twitter using the handle at IIEA. We're also live streaming this afternoon's discussion, so a very warm welcome to all of you tuning in via YouTube. Finally, before the main event, please allow me to hand over to Dr. Emer Cotter, who is Director of the Office of Evidence and Assessment at EPA, to offer some opening remarks before Kate's presentation. Kate, thanks for being with us. and. Emer, please, the floor is yours. Thanks very much, Barry, and thank you for the opportunity to, to make some brief opening remarks ahead of what would be a really interesting lecture from Kate Ray Rayworth, and indeed to welcome Kate to the IIEA's um, Environmental Resilience Lecture Series that we have been delighted to support in the EPA over the last number of years. One of our roles in the EPA is to be a voice for Ireland's environment, and we do that through our leadership, through um, our advocacy and partnering and working with others. So partnering on this lecture series with the IIEA is a really important um, aspect of that for us to inform and stimulate the debate and the discussion in Ireland on the environmental challenges. So just by way of opening, I'm going to make a, a, a number of, remark of, of opening brief remarks to, to link the concepts of donut economics to some of the environmental challenges that we're, we're seeing in Ireland at the moment. We, we see time and again how key environmental indicators in Ireland are tracking economic growth. Our most latest greenhouse gas emissions for 2021 increased by nearly 5% as the economy rebounded following COVID restrictions and, and started to recover. We saw emissions growing in tandem with that economic activity. When we look at our waste um, statistics and waste generation, we also see a really tight coupling of economic activity with waste generation from our homes and from our businesses. 
So if the overall goal of, of donut economics is to move away from endless GDP growth, to instead look at meeting the needs of all people within the means of the living planet, and Kate will, will talk to us a lot more about this over the course of our lecture. If they, they are the goals, we have we are facing significant challenges in Ireland when we look at our environmental data sets. One of the areas that we're very focused on in the moment in the EPA is around fostering and stimulating a circular economy in Ireland. And that is just one of the aspects that I think we can learn a lot from donut economics as we look and evolve and grow work in this space. Um, we've set up a dedicated program in the EPA that's looking um, at circular, at, at promoting and, and fostering a circular economy. And we'll do that through our, our evidence, through our engagement and through our regulatory activities. And indeed, in our new strategic action plan that um, would bring us out to 2026 as an organization, one of our core strategic outcomes is to promote a transition to sustainable production and consumption. So, so the concepts of donut economics is something that we um, and, and I see we can really learn from, particularly looking at systems thinking um, around being regenerative. And I'm really looking forward to hearing what Kate has to say today and then bringing those, that thinking and those, uh, those, those thoughts back into our own work in, in the EPA. And I'm sure the, the, the large audience here um, will stimulate it. And with this, this lecture will stimulate their own thoughts in, in terms of their own work um, into the future. So thank you very much for this opportunity. And I'll hand over straight away now to, to Kate. Thank you so much. It's a huge pleasure to join you. Thank you for such a generous uh, introduction. And um, I, yeah, I'm really, really excited about things that are happening in Ireland and in relation to donor economics and how this can be in service of the transition that's clearly wanting and emerging in your country. So let me share my screen and jump in with the core concepts. Hang on a moment. Um, the core of, of donor economics. So let me begin with a health warning, right? You don't have to eat donuts to be into donut economics. Um, the doctors would not forgive me if I didn't be, be clear with that. The best donuts are, of course, conceptual because they transform the way we think. So I'm going to introduce you to a conceptual donut. But first, but first, let's begin where I began with my economics education. And I believe anyone who's had an economics education will have been introduced to these ideas that I was taught and I was deeply frustrated by because and I think they're far too widely taught now. I'm going to call this 20th century economics because I think it's profoundly out of date and does not serve this century. In this worldview that we get taught in university or we hear politicians in, in parliament or we read in the economic pages of the newspaper, the first image that students are ever taught is the supply and demand of the market. It puts the market at the center of our vision. It makes price the metric of concern. It means that anything that falls outside a price contract is called an externality in economic language. Now that means that the ongoing destruction of the living world shows up as an environmental externality. And for me, that's reason enough to leave this thinking behind. There's no way we can call our destruction and breakdown of the living world on which we depend an externality to anything. It's our foundation. The selfie of humanity that gets put at the center of economic thinking is rational economic man. This is the character within the economic models. And he shapes us. The more we're told about him, the more we start to mimic him, which is dangerous because he's depicted as a man with no dependence. He's got money in his hand. He interacts with the world of the market. He's got ego in his heart, a calculator in his head. He's got nature at his feet. The more the students learn about the character, this character, the more they value self-interest and competition over collaboration and altruism. So who we tell ourselves we are shapes who we become. We need a far richer understanding of humanity and our capacity to collaborate because we are, of course, the most social of all animals. And lastly, the goal. What is the goal that's placed at the center of 20th century economics? It's, it's already been mentioned by Ima. It's growth, endless growth, no matter how rich a nation already is. It's politicians and economists will tell us that the solution to its problems lies in yet more growth endlessly. And there's something ultimately insane about that. I believe these ideas and others have profoundly shaped the mindset that's led us to where we are. And it's not a good place. The 21st century we know has begun with repeated crisis of financial meltdown from 2008, which has a long tail in many people's lives, from climate and ecological breakdown, which is the frame of our time. Protest crackdown, as people speak up for the living world, we've seen an extraordinary resistance and actually 
more police powers brought in into to being to push back against that rise up and then covid lockdown that we've all lived through for the last couple of years these crises they are reported separately but they are deeply interconnected they show us how connected we are with each other and the rest of the living world they show us that they hit with extremes of inequality of gender and race of wealth and power between the global north and the global south but they all arise from systems that are based on endless expansion if you try to finance and endlessly expand the financial system, you will create a bubble that bursts on itself. If we endlessly use Earth's fossil fuels and minerals, we will induce climate and ecological breakdown. And if we endlessly expand human settlements into areas of wildlife and couple that with global travel, we create perfect conditions for zoonotic disease transfer. So we need a new vision of well-being, of success, of development, of thriving that does not depend upon the endless concept of endless expansion. And in service of that new vision, I offer the donut one possible way of imagining that new future. So think of it as a compass for human prosperity. The goal, leave no one in the hole, falling short on the essentials of life. That's where people don't have the resources they need to lead a decent life. And the UN and the world's governments have already agreed that no person in the world should be left in that hole. That's a powerful global commitment. Leave no one in the hole below that social foundation. But... At the same time, as we collectively use Earth's resources, make sure we don't overshoot that ecological ceiling of planetary boundaries, the life supporting systems that make life work on this planet, that keep her in a stable balance of, of a stable climate and healthy oceans and fertile soils and abundant biodiversity and recharging water in the lakes and rivers and a protective ozone layer overhead. So the goal, leave no one in the hole, don't overshoot the limits. We've got to thrive in the space between where we meet the needs of all people within the means of the planet. And suddenly the shape of progress has changed. It's not this ever rising line of growth. It's thriving in balance between those boundaries, which looks just like a heartbeat when you do it like this. And I think that reconnects us to our bodies. We know in our bodies that health lies in balance, this delicately balanced living system that is each one of us. Health lies in balance. Can we take what we deeply understand in our own bodies, take that to the planetary body and find health in an economy in the 21st century? When I first drew this diagram over 10 years ago, I was amazed by the traction it had, by the response that people had to it. They felt empowered, permitted to open a new economic conversation. And I looked at the way that many indigenous cultures have for millennia depicted well-being, thriving, flourishing, health. And I was amazed to see that so often it's this dynamic circle. There's something very profound about the circular shape, but with a dynamism of life within it. So can we return and can we learn from those cultures and find our own way back to thriving, not being endless growth, but thriving, being in balance? If that's where we want to get to that place of balance, we're very, very far from there right now. All the red in the middle shows you the extent to which people are falling short on life's essentials. Billions of people without the food, water, health, income, that every person has a claim to, but we are already overshooting multiple planetary boundaries. In fact, Earth system scientists are in the process of updating the planetary boundary science. It's going to be, get even more extreme. We are learning more that we were even more in overshoot of Earth systems. This is a confronting image. And let me overlay it with headlines that we, we turn the newspapers or scroll through the news feed, and these headlines come now every day but they are telling us again and again, we are breaking down the life supporting systems of our planetary home. And these rebound upon us, of course, humans are affected directly by the breakdown of our life support systems. Recently with water and energy crisis, not just in low income countries that always experience these crises, but here in high income countries and food prices, the cost of living crisis, it's all interconnected. And the richest 1% of people in the world own half of the world's wealth. So this is not only a deeply ecologically degraded world, it's a phenomenally socially divided world. This is our inheritance. This is what we see and we now know. And I really believe that our children's children will tap us on the shoulder and say, what did you do once that you knew? Once you saw this, once you saw this 21st century situation and you understand the double-sided nature of this challenge, and that just growth wasn't going to solve that. What did you do once that you knew? What did you do in the way you live, the way you work and 
invest and divest and protest and volunteer and how did you change and and we must ask ourselves how do we change and how do we bring this into our lives because let's recognize that last century's economic theories and government policies and business models and community lifestyles none of them were designed to turn this story around so we need new theories we need new policies new business models we need new ways of living if we are going to be the generation that actually starts turning the human story around now i'm showing you the global donut but most policy and action takes place close to home so let's bring it down to the national level four nations you've got malawi on one and a half thousand dollars per person per year a lot of social shortfall and poverty but without overshooting their share of pressure on the planet china has that double whammy of human shortfall and already ecological overshoot let's jump to the us on sixty-four thousand dollars a year they should have a blue center circle but no they have high levels of inequality that we know of which means that deprivation is experienced in cities across the nation even in one of the richest countries in the world but massive ecological overshoot and then i've put here denmark or i could have put sweden or i could have put norway or the netherlands or iceland where people say but surely surely scandinavia surely they are living in the donut no they're not no like all high income countries they are overshooting planetary boundaries there's one country that's closer than any other to living in the donut it's costa rica right they have closer to meeting people's needs almost within the means of the planet and this must give everybody hope on around $21,000 per person per year they are closer than any other nation to living in that space this and, and they haven't actively been targeting this so this gives us hope what could it look like if we all actually aim for this now here's over 50 nations and the goal is to be in that donut sweet spot in the top left hand corner where we meet the needs of all people but we do it within the means of the living planet you want to know where ireland is right there you are you're right there now that's not bad i mean you know hello australia canada and the us right that's different and therefore Maybe you have a, a responsibility to show the high income world that we can be part of a transformation. Let's recognize that these countries are interconnected, right? Through histories of colonialism, through military and corporate power, through trade and finance rules, through resource extraction and current and future impacts of climate change. So they're not separated like spots on this scatter plot. They are interconnected in their stories predominantly power from the global north impacting on those in the global south. So we need transformation within and between these nations. But let's just take a moment and recognize that if there's not a single country in the donut, then I can't see any country here that deserves to call itself a developed country or an advanced nation. There's absolutely nothing developed or advanced about overshooting planetary boundaries and undermining Earth's life support systems for everybody else. Let's step back and, and recognize that the history of economic development has been in this direction. Heading towards the donut, but then straight past it and massively into overshoot. That dynamic of 20th century growth has come with extreme degeneration of the living world. That's where we see the red overshoot emerging and divisive, capturing income and value in the, in the hands of a few. We need a completely different approach if we're going to go not straight past the donut, but actually towards it. And that's what's exciting. What if every nation transforms, but on its own path? depending on its starting point. What if low-income nations were to rise, were to meet the needs of all of their people for the first time without overshooting planetary boundaries in the way that every country before them has done? That's never been done before. What if middle-income countries were to totally shift and reorient so that they actually start to meet people's needs, but while coming back within planetary boundaries, how would they do that? What kind of economic and infrastructural transition would that be? What if those countries closest to living in the donut were to actually arrive? And I do note that Ireland is quite close to the letter E there. What if these countries, Costa Rica, Mauritius, Chile, Jordan, Mexico, Ireland, were to arrive and actually show the world that it's possible to meet the needs of all your people while coming back within planetary boundaries? That would be extraordinary leadership and inspiration for all. And then the high income nations, which surely with all that red on the screen have a huge obligation to massively reduce their overshoot of planetary boundaries by decarbonizing and dematerializing the economies. None of these journeys and pathways have been followed before. This is all unprecedented. So this means that every nation needs extraordinary levels of humility and unprecedented ambition. 
We need to go on a different dynamic path, one that is not degenerative, but regenerative, one that's not divisive, but distributive. So let me say a little bit about what I mean by each of those. We've inherited linear degenerative economic systems, industrial processes that just seem normal as we grow up surrounded by them, but they take us materials, make it into stuff we want, use it for a while, often just once, and then we throw it away. And that's what's running down the life support systems of this planet. We have to bend those linear arrows into circular cyclical arrows where resources aren't used up, they're used again and again, far more carefully, collectively, creatively, and slowly so that we learn to work with and within the cycles of the living world, so that we restore nature's generosity and then learn to be part of her cyclical genius, which makes life work. What could that look like? And we're talking not just going from degenerative to sustainable, do no harm, zero deforestation, zero pollution, zero carbon. Nature doesn't do zero. Nature's generous. She sequesters carbon. She cleans the water. She cleanses the air. She houses biodiversity. That's the cycle of life. So can we go past just doing no harm, 100% less bad, to actually regenerating and doing good and contributing and, and enabling nature cycles again? That's a transformative leap of design. And nature's crying out for it. Look, look at the difference it feels to look at that degraded landscape and that restoring landscape. It just... You take an in breath, you feel like life is life still has the possibility to return. She is still generous to us. And then in terms of technical materials, things that don't belong in biological systems, human plastics and metals and minerals that we have created and transformed, no longer dumped in the neighborhoods of the world's poorest people, but no longer just 100% recyclable. What if we can just avoid that recyclable step and actually go upstream, repair it? Replace just the part that's broken, refurbish it, reuse it, share it, remanufacture it. And that's where the circular economy and modular design is key. It's not about just cycling materials more and more crazily around a loop. It's preventing that looping in the first place from a deep redesign of how things are built, but how they're owned and how they're used. So from degenerative to regenerative, but also we have inherited systems, whether through privilege or law or regulation, inheritance that are divisive by design. They capture opportunity and value in the hands of a few. And we see it, a rise of a 1% supercharged by COVID nationally and globally. How can that divisive system become far more distributive so that value and opportunity that's created is shared far more equitably with everybody who co-creates it? And that turns out to be the whole of society. Again, we're not just going from divisive to inclusive. And I decided to say here, like, you know, a traffic jam, traffic jam of cars. Inclusive one is that the bus gets to sit in the traffic jam of cars. We've all been on that bus. I don't want to be included in that traffic jam. I don't want to be part of that old system. We want to go to distributive where we redesign the system so that in this case, a bus is affordable. It's the cheapest, fastest, cleanest, most sensible way to get into the city center. So redesign the system. So we're not just including excluded people, but actually distributing opportunity to those who need it. And we can take that into the world of work, not just going from paying poverty wages to paying people a living wage. You can just about get by in this system. What if we actually transform the ownership of enterprise so that those employed get a living wage and a profit share of the profit they contribute to creating? Redesigning the system so that they're far more distributive. So from degenerative to regenerative, divisive to distributive. Cities around the world, ever since we launched the Donut Economics Action Lab, have said, what would it mean to do that here? Could we, could we bring those principles and these tools to where we are? And I'm going to now just show you the tool that we create and invite you to imagine from wherever you are, whether it's a city or a town or a village or a neighborhood or a district, what would it mean to do this where you are? So how can our city, our place, help bring humanity into the Donut? Well, first, we need to unroll it. We need to make some space between that social foundation and ecological ceiling so that we can go inside and we open it up and we ask this question, wherever you are, how can your place become a home to thriving people in an ecologically thriving place while respecting the well-being of all people and the health of the whole planet?
That's a very complex question, I know. So let's break it down into what we call the four lenses. And we've got on the one side, the local aspirations, and on the other side, global responsibilities, both social and ecological. So let's start with the local people of the place. How can all the people of our city or place thrive? What would it mean for everybody here to have good food, great schools for their kids to go to, good healthcare, great mobility, good housing, good well-paid jobs so that we can all live well here. And that's a local conversation of what thriving looks like here. And that conversation, of course, needs to happen in every community that decides to enter into it. It's set by the values, the culture, the traditions of a place. That's what a good life here is. And then what would it mean to add to that? How can our place be as generous as the wildland next door? So if the biomimicry thinker Janine Benyus were with us right now, she'd say, take me to the wildland next door, wherever you are. Take me to that place where nature is in her healthiest natural habitat. Not completely wild because humans have changed that, but healthy as possible nature near you. And what is nature doing there? In every location on earth, nature has a genius of sequestering carbon, of storing groundwater after a storm, of cooling the air from the treetops to the forest floor, of housing biodiversity, cleaning the, cleaning the air so we can breathe, building soil. What if those ecological performance standards from your nearby wildland, literally you took those standards and said, can our town or our city or our village be as generous as that? Can we sequester carbon instead of releasing it? Can we harvest energy through solar panels or growing food instead of having it bouncing off buildings and creating an urban heat island effect? Can we cool the air from the treetops to the forest floor in our city on a hot day? And I love the, the ambition, the wild ambition of this, but it's wild and utterly natural. How can we create settlements that actually belong as part of the ecosystems in which they're located? Now, these local aspirations, thriving people in a thriving place, this is why people think of Denmark and Sweden and Norway. Surely it's thriving. Yeah, they may be doing really well on these two lenses, but that's just half the story because we know that every city or place is connected into global supply chains and depends upon people and planet worldwide to live well. So how are we affecting or respecting them? So now we need to go to our global responsibilities. How can the way we live here respect the health of the whole planet? This takes us to that overshoot of planetary boundaries, the red that we see. How can we decarbonize, cut our impact on climate change? How can we dematerialize the materials and the food and the clothing and the consumer goods and the electronics we buy? How can we stop having such an intensive material through flow and actually circulate many more of them around so we're not putting all that pressure on the planet? And still thinking of the supply chains that, that make our lives work in cities and places every day. Who stitched the clothes we wear? Who picked and packed the food we eat for lunch? Who assembled our phones and computers? What are the labor rights in those global supply chains? Are they paid well? Who is affected by the way we live here, the impacts of climate change that we know are hitting? And if people come in search of refuge, how are they welcomed? the official policy and the community culture. What else can places do to respect and connect and show solidarity, whether it's through university scholarships or arts or sports, how can we show solidarity with those worldwide? So these are the four lenses and I know there's a lot going on, but you know what happens when you get city councillors and community members sitting around it? People often show up with a real invested interest in one particular aspect. I'm here about community. I'm here about climate change. I'm hearing about biodiversity in our local town. I'm here about fair trade and people's rights worldwide. And they each find that they can be seen because it's visible. And when you're seen, it's easier to not only hold what you care about, but to hear others and to connect and listen and see the deep interconnections between all of these issues. And how can we transform the way we live in our cities in ways that will actually have multiple benefits across these lenses? We've done this work with many places that have approached us, only ever with places that have approached us and says, you know, this looks like a great tool for the transformation we want to bring about here with city governments and with community organizations. And I'm just gonna share with you a few of those that are popping up around the world. So Barcelona have decided to create a city portrait. The city council are using it. And as you can see, they've got the donut unrolled there and they're gathering what they think is the relevant data to tell their story. So it's not, an imposed data set. They're saying, what do we think, given the data we have available, given what we aspire to here, our values and our goals, what are we going to use to measure how we are performing within those four lenses? 
and they're involving community members. So making it a community conversation, gathering people's views about what's already going well, what's really not going well, how we can improve, where we can learn from. In Cornwall, in the UK, Cornwall Council decided to create their own adapted version of the donut and use it as a decision making wheel so that when a new project comes along, like the Saints Trail, which is a bike trail, will this improve things? Will it have a negative impact? How could we redesign it so that it improves things? And then on the right hand side, you can see in lots of different colors, it's their assessment of how they're doing over time. And what I love about the wheel that's on the far right here with the red and the yellow and green and blue is you can immediately see where they think they're getting better, improving on waste and reducing carbon emissions and air pollution, where things are still getting worse, like on ocean health, and where things have stayed the same. That is so much a richer readout than anybody just telling you what happened to Cornwall's GDP over the last five years. This tells us about the real human and ecological metrics of the place and people's ambition to bring about change. So this alone is a reason to move away from thinking that we can measure development through GDP, one number that tells us nothing of what's actually going on to much richer dashboard that shows life in human and natural metrics. In Bhutan, the city region of Timpu have decided they want to use the donut together with their concept of gross national happiness. There's a lot of interconnection between the two. And so we've been working with them online, running Zoom conferences for 100 Bhutanese government officials, introducing them to the concepts of regenerative and distributive design. And I say introducing, but of course, Bhutan is a country that has deep traditions of regenerative and distributive practice. So connecting with their very deep cultural traditions, these ideas, and how can they hold those cultural traditions even as many more modern influences come into the city and the region. In Amsterdam, not only is the city government included the donut as a core concept in its circularity strategy, but civic society have picked the concept up and said, so much of what we're already doing here actually resonates with getting into the donut. So we want to use it as a concept, the Amsterdam Donut Coalition created a website showing all the projects that are already going on. And it's really important to celebrate everything that's already in motion to show that we are already in motion towards this, as well as recognizing the challenges that we need to turn around. And we celebrated last year donut pioneers, organizations that were pioneering in tackling both social and ecological issues at the same time within the city, whether it's a canteen or a new housing development or a textiles company or a furniture making company. And then I want to land in a city just a couple of train stops away from where I am in Birmingham, an amazing organization called Civic Square, who are bringing this down to the community level, street by street, talking to people in one neighborhood. What would it mean to do a street level retrofit here? What would it mean for everybody to feel they could be part of the economic conversation? And you can see just from the playfulness and the engagingness that this is inviting and not intimidating, right? Economics, we know, intimidates a lot of people, but we'll call it donut economics and everyone knows there's something fun going on. And these guys have really made it irresistible to get involved. If, if that is your community level scale, I really invite you to look at what they're doing. It's all on Deals platform. Now, is any of this happening where you are? Of course it is. Let me show you a few things that have been happening. The Irish Museum of Modern Art has had the, the Earth Rising Festival and there was a wonderful workshop one of my colleagues held there working, as you can see, together with people looking at the four lenses on the ground. So starting to plot out literally physically in the space, the four lenses of the donut. What does this mean where people people assemble, where they were living? What were the values and the, the issues they wanted to bring there? And then there's the, the uh, Dublin discussion group having donuts plus chat, regular meetings. There's another one coming up. Again, it's going to be on our platform, donuteconomics.org, if you want to join in there. The Irish Donut Economics Network was really the, one of the very first networks to form around donut economics. They're popping up all over the world. And they've been holding monthly meetings with inviting people from across Ireland. Next one's 23rd of February. It's going to be on Deals platform. Again, if you're interested, just showing up for cuppa. What's interesting to you? How? What do we want to do? Who's interested in these ideas? And then the West Cork Donut Economy Network have been facilitating donut, network, um, donut workshops and have got more coming up in May, two coming up in May. And then the West Cork Feel Good Festival has workshops coming up in six towns and villages. So I'm showing you all of this so that if you go on our platform and have a look, you will see these events are about to be posted. You can get involved. You can make it happen where you are. You can decide how you want to be involved. A lot of community initiative. And last one I'm gonna show is that Dublin City Council last September voted to implement the policies of donut economics in the local economic and community plan. They have embedded donut economics in the social ecological statement, 
and are now about to launch a public consultation engagement and are exploring ideas around creating a city portrait. So this makes me really want to come and visit Dublin because there's such amazing energy bubbling up, not only Dublin, West Cork and all sorts of places and around Ireland. And I hear there are other things bubbling up in other places that I won't name until they name themselves, but I know things are brewing. So let me pull right back. I began with 20th century economics, and the only tragedy here is that this is still far too often taught in universities around the world. And it's time to move on because these ideas don't serve us. And the students of today are actually, they, they began as climate strikers. Many of the students I teach currently have been striking as teenagers since they were 15, 16 years old. And now they're in university and they want an education that's fit for their awareness of what's happening and it's fit empowers them to be the policymakers, the business leaders the community organizers the journalists the lawyers the doctors who take us through the 21st century with a deeply ecologically grounded mindset it must come through in an economics education and a design education and all forms of education so let's start ourselves with 21st century concepts that put at the center of our vision a goal which is to meet the needs of all within the means of the living planet. If the donut does it for you, fantastic. If another framework does it for you, fantastic. This is a network, an ecosystem of ideas moving together. Let's recognize we are the most social of all mammals. And it's our pro-sociality, our reciprocity that enables us to redesign our economy into one where we share and connect. We need to become regenerative and distributive by design. And I've shown you just a couple of the tools that we've created the cities like Barcelona that's putting into practice and the communities like this beautiful workshop that happened in Dublin, beginning to experiment with what does this mean like in our community, in our place. And at Donut Economics Action Lab, we, we're turning the principles and the ideas from the book into data and indicators and metrics for those for whom that's a tool, turning into tools for cities and places, working with companies, working with community organizations and working with teachers and students in schools because these are the communities that have come to us. And so these are the communities we're responding to. How can we turn these ideas into irresistible tools and practice with you? And let's learn together. And there's nothing more powerful than peer-to-peer -peer inspiration. When someone like yourself says, well, we're doing this, we're beginning, we're just starting. That's the only way to begin. It creates massive ripples of inspiration. So I can't wait to see what's bubbling up in Ireland and the way it will create ripples across your nation. Let me finish by saying we began Donut Economics Action Lab because crazy people started doing playful things with the donut. And so we formed it as a platform inviting anybody. You're all welcome to either join as a member. We've got over 10,000 members now or just to browse and have a look at the tools. But if you want to use the tools, please do join and share back what you learned. That's the reciprocity we ask for. And the tools that I've shared today are the Donut Unrolled tools, which you could have a look at and explore and see if that makes sense for your place. Kick off a conversation or join one that's happening. I'll stop there and I really look forward to the conversation. Thank you. There we are. That was incredible. And thank you very much. I, I'm going to have to try and gather my thoughts a little bit. I'm, I'm still hooked on crazy people started doing playful things with donuts, <laughs> right? I don't think any of us spend enough time doing playful things with donuts. Um, there's no shortage of questions, but I'm actually, I'm just going to go. I have some myself. But there was one that just came in from a, uh, if I can find it, regarding what you were just talking about, the resources, that we had a question from uh, Porig McAvoy, who just asked, are there resources for academics working with students to introduce assessment criteria related to sustainable, between parentheses, engineering learning? I think the answer is probably yes, that resources are available because you just mentioned. But where would you direct Porig to if he wants to find further resources? Great. So we do work with academia because um, we're thrilled that teachers in schools and in universities are using these concepts. And some master's courses have said we've used donut economics as a course textbook yeah. because it just gives students that overview. And there's over 100 academic articles that have been mm. written using the concept of the donut actively within the paper. And around 20 students have, have used it in their dissertations and master's theses. We haven't created those exact assessment tools that you've mentioned, but hey, Maybe you want to create them and work with students. Important. So the, the tools are out there. How would you adapt that? If we just ask if you start to create something, share it back and bring it to that. You could you could create an event on our platform and say, does anybody want to help start co-creating this? And then we could turn that into a new tool. That's how we're working, by putting these ideas together and working in the commons. Well, there you are. That sounds like an invitation, Porig. Um, but can I just add, it's on, if you go to donuteconomics.org, 
and you click on themes, there's a theme research in academia, and that's where you'll find all the academic resources I just mentioned. Fantastic. I'm going to give people a chance. There's a couple of questions coming in, but I'm going to ask a question, Kate, if I may, whilst people gather their own thoughts. So you identified yourself as an economist from the start and the kind of the discussion around how economics is taught. I'm a political scientist and I have similar questions about how politics is taught. And I'm just thinking over the course of your presentation, you spoke about towns and cities and regions and communities and indeed the global level, which are like, they're all the most exciting levels of politics to look at anyway. But one of the only times that that, that the state occurred was, was in your scatter plot. And like the, the state is still our, our go-to unit of analysis when thinking about politics. But I'm left with the impression from your presentation that at least when it comes to these challenges, is the is the role of the state somewhat more limited when compared to the community level or the international level? Where does the state fit in, do you think? Great question. I think the role of the state's huge. The reason I started and focused on all the examples I showed is because that's where the energy this has come from for us. So when we opened our Economics Action Lab, we had a really strong principle. We go where the energy is. We've never once tried to convince or lobby or persuade anybody to use any of these tools. So everything I showed you was because people in places said, this looks useful for us. And the first people who showed up were either community organizations or cities and councillors and mayors. So that's where we've been working. And because of the power of peer-to-peer -peer inspiration, when Amsterdam launched their engagement with it in April 2020, that kicked off Copenhagen and Brussels and Barcelona and Glasgow and Nanaimo and so on. So cities have inspired each other. There is stuff going on at the national level. Um, we are getting approached more and more now, actually, by individual nations, often political parties or civil servants. So I've done a lot of talks for civil servants working within environmental departments or economic affairs, mm -hmm. a, lot, a lot at the international level as well. I will bring that when when they go official online. But but we've had really mm -hmm. good we've had really good um, engagement with the concepts across political parties across the political spectrum. Indeed, I know the donut economics has been mentioned um, in in Parliament in Ireland. So it's gauge, and I think I think national level politicians need to see critical mass building right, and they see it mm -hmm. when they see it. So European Commission, for example, about to hold a post growth conference in May next year. There's a lot of engagement with donor economics there. And I think it's because they're seeing lots of pretty big cities in Europe are engaging with this. So it, it bubbles up. And I think often that's what national politics does. It waits until it sees critical mass and legitimacy of an idea bubbling up before it's a, a safe space to stand and actually to start advocating for that. So we're finding more and more calls are coming through from national governments, whether it's the current government, opposition mm. parties, or the civil servants saying, we need new ideas. What's going on? How can we lift up from what's happening at the, at the local level and bring international politics? That's that's brilliant. I have one, one more related question before turning to, to our, our enthusiastic audience. I'm sure other people are thinking about Costa Rica. I've never been there, but I know a little bit about it. It's a fascinating place. Can, can you say anything about the choices that were made there? Or maybe is it the interests that there are there? that somehow makes them a relative success? Yeah, so I've never been there either. But um, what, so some people say, oh, Costa Rica, isn't it just because they don't have an army because they've got, you know, Fine. United yeah. States, right? So that's a kind of geopolitics explanation, if you want. I think there's also uh, national decision and policy choices. So they have invested more in health and education, public health and education for all, which we, you know, we've known for decades is one of the most important ways of investing in your nation is to invest in the fundamental wealth of the health and education of every human being. That's our fundamental health. So they've invested in that. And they had, like many places, steady, steady decline of the forest, right? De ongoing deforestation. And in 1987, they stopped the deforestation. If you look at a graph of Costa Rica's deforestation, it goes down, 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 loss of forest. And then it just suddenly does this uptick Mm. And it starts coming back. And when I was talking to some officials from Costa Rica last year, they said, we didn't actually, when we stopped that, we didn't realize the incredible benefits that this was going to give, which would we'd have this incredible tourism of people coming to visit the nature that was restoring the regenerative nature. Now, when people think of Costa Rica, we think of an ecosystem and a natural wealth. And so how can other countries recognize that people are drawn and attracted by that ecological wealth, but also not just depending on tourism, of course, and we can't have everybody flying across the world all the time. It needs to be embedding a, a nature-based economy within 
the natural wealth. So real innovation in recognizing the wealth of biodiversity. I'm sitting in the UK, there's a huge ecological biodiversity depletion here. We mm -hmm. need to see a resurgence of that and connect that with not only with farming, but with recreation and with the way we build our cities and towns and, and, and spaces. So tackling it from both sides, proactive protection and restoration of ecology. You're making me think as well, Kate, it's the it's the European year of skills and beyond tourism, there must be some wonderful opportunities in the donor economy for people to have really cool and interesting jobs as well. I, I don't know if you've anything to say about that. Is there is there anything to be said for the jobs that don't exist yet that, that the donor economy will, will yield? Yes. And let me speak to regenerative design. So it brings it turns that linear loop back into a regenerative ecosystem yeah, yeah. and the, the 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 use and, and even just when i was saying it right uh, reuse replace refurbish remake uh who's going to do that these are jobs these are creative skilled jobs with pride about caring more about the things we make and remake and they're also really creative mm -hmm. right people love having coffee in a, a cafe that used to be a railway tunnel for example right why, why do we love that we love the reinvention of spaces we love thinking what things have been and what they can be and what they can become and we can keep having that relationship with the reinvention of materials in copenhagen they're building beautiful buildings that have huge chunks in them that you can see have just been imported bricks brick walls from somewhere else like a like a mosaic made of old building so there's a lot of creativity and this will bring jobs back to localities i think it'll make look, jobs in localities worldwide so it's not only regenerative it's distributive yeah one of the really nice things we have in ireland lately i know you're describing it in cornwall as well where, where i'm from in the southeast uh, the old railway line it's a it's a horror show that it was taken away but it's been repurposed for a lovely greenway for people to kind of uh, exercise and cycle on and it's right. created a lot of economic opportunities um i'm, I'm going to move to a, a question from the audience but i want to preface it with something because it's related it's i had a similar thought myself when we were looking at how perilously out of balance that really mm. arresting image you had mm. of how the life support systems are really breaking down it's it's almost intimidating it is intimidating mm. the wide range of things from ocean initiatification and climate change and land conversion and like given the dynamics of the whole system they all kind of obviously interact and support or take from one another related to this Deirdre Lane asked a question and I think it was the kind of I was having the same impulse a moment ago Kate uh, thank you for being here, Deirdre Lane. Kate asks, given the climate emergency, where should we focus our energy on? Like all the parts of the donut, is there any that is more equal than others or any that kind of, you know, we can tend to more easily if there's policy solutions to address um, over any of the others? Could you comment? Um, so just to bring yeah. that intimidating, arresting image back. So there is a temptation to say climate emergency, and therefore we must focus all our attention on cutting carbon emissions. One of the reasons the planetary boundary scientists drew this uh, planetary boundaries back in 2009 was to make sure that the world didn't become single-minded only about only one very, very critical life support system of earth, right? It's like if I had indigestion and my doctor cared only about my digestive system and cared nothing about my my respiratory system or my nervous system and was I don't want that doctor I, I want a doctor who understands that every system is part of a whole so they they created this to say hey there are other key systems that are under pressure and it and yet we find it very hard and probably overwhelming to think of all nine so as many people will know that the current focus is on climate and ecological breakdown and all the processes that lead to massive biodiversity loss and the breakdown of the integrity of ecosystems, which is impacted by farming, by industry, by settlements, by so many other things. So I would say it's in these two areas, particularly that they know they're profoundly interconnected with all others, climate change and biodiversity loss. And that's why we hear climate and ecological breakdown has become um, very important. What's the, what's the one change? I'm not a, I'm not a, mm -hmm. I'm not focused on recommending specific policies, and I think they really matter in different places. As you can hear from where I began, to me, the one big change is here. It's the mindset. It's the mindset that moves away from thinking that success is endless growth to realizing that it's thriving in balance, and it's the health of this planet. And therefore, it's changing the dynamics. And, and in, in everything we do, looking not for linear degrading systems, throw away, there is no away, but regenerative design. And yes, that's huge. But how do we bring that into the way we turn from car-based travel to 
bike and foot and buses? How do we bring that into the way we re rethink and redesign what we eat and how we travel and how we invest and divest? How do we bring that into all of the policies, into the housing policy? So bringing this new mindset of regenerative and distributive design, to me, that's the biggest change I seek to make. There are many other specific policies that are needed, but <clears throat> I'm focusing my attention there because I think when we make that change, a lot of it becomes common sense mm. and it's hard to see it any other way and it, it i'm sure it at least in part starts with with conversations like this that you're having with uh 150 new friends um i'm exactly. going to turn to a question from from killian stokes uh and killian says amazing thanks for the talk killian has been applying your donor principles with moi coffee ireland from farmer and forest to mug so so there's a plug killian would be very interested to hear your thoughts on donor economics and the investment community talking about pensions and ESG or donut economics and startup movements or entrepreneurs quite a lot there, but I would be keen, especially on the investment piece. If you have anything to say. Yes. Right. We do a lot of work with businesses. Um, and every time a company comes to us and says, we want to do business in the donut. And they might say, oh, here's our product. I'm just holding up some random hand cream. It's like, here's our product. And it's sustainable. And the plastic is biodegradable. And we say, look, that sounds great. We don't want to talk about your product. We want to talk about the design of your company. Five things. Here it is. What is your purpose? Why does your company even exist in the world? What's it in service of? What are your networks? How do you relate to your customers, your suppliers, your uh, your employees, your supply chain workers, how do you relate to the rest of your industry? Are you in an extractive relationship or actually are you living out your purpose and your values through those relationships? How are you governed? Who has voice in decision making? Who's in the room when decisions are taken? What are the metrics of success and what are the incentives for middle management? Are they aligned with that or, or actually counter to that? How are you owned? How is this company owned? Is it owned by shareholders, by a founding family, by a single entrepreneur, by employees, by a cooperative? Is it owned by its workers? Because how it's owned will profoundly shape what sits deepest is most powerful, how it's financed and where that finance is coming from, and therefore what it's expecting and demanding is if it's in a major shareholder owned company, well, it's owned by shareholders who put their finance in with expectation of returns. And so the purpose is to maximize returns for those shareholders and everything is geared towards that, even if the website has a different strap line. Everything is geared around the quarterly report to show we're, we're generating high dividends for, for, for shareholders. So many other designs that enable ownership, whether it's of the employees, of the workers, that mm. actually puts finance in service to that purpose. So we can redesign companies. Now, if, if Killian's talking about Moya Coffee, which I believe also is in the Netherlands, the thing I know about Moya Coffee is that they wanted to make sure that coffee, the value of coffee is not just captured in the importing country and, you know, send us your beans and we'll do everything else and all the values here, but actually installing mm. roasteries in Ethiopia and other countries of production so that the value is captured there. That to me is distributive design because it's making sure that people throughout the supply chain, those who've done the work capture more of the value. So that's an example of a company that actually has a purpose and that design and drives the, the design of the company. So I invite every company, anybody interested in a company to be a detective about that company. How is it designed? Because that will ultimately determine whether or not it can become regenerative and distributive by design or whether because of its current design and finance and ownership, it's stuck and it's going to be de degenerative and divisive. And that's a tricky moment for companies. When mm. we talk with people in very big companies, they realize oh, those quarterly reports are really basically getting in the way of us from, from transforming ourselves. And it's going to go beyond just mere ESG reporting. That That's a, yeah. a, in the direction of, but it, it it's, as I'm sure anyone asking the question knows, it's nothing like on the scale of the transformation needed. A related question, uh, Kate, and it goes back to one of the first things you said in our, our discussions today. Noel Cahill, Harry Noel says, can the appropriate treatment of externalities be part of the solution? The overshooting of planetary boundaries can be understood as arising from the decisions of consumers, producers and governments making decisions while not taking account of all the external consequences of their decisions. What do you think? So, yes, I know there's many um, environmental economists who, with great intention, are seeking to bring about uh, a thriving world by internalizing the externalities, which is where I began talking about, right? The supply and demand and anything left mm. outside the market contract is by definition called an externality. I personally feel that that framing 
is 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 throwing us off and i'm i'm going to playfully push back and say you know if aliens wanted to destroy life on earth they don't even need to arrive here they don't need to send spaceships or green lasers or anything if they just persuade us to talk about the damage and destruction we do to our planetary home as an environmental externality and call it just in a macro economy call it just another form of capital not the living world's another natural capital mm. i mean that is the the most powerful way to marginalize the foundations of life in our economic mindset so i can see logical ways in which one can seek to make visible environmental externalities but i don't think they're external they're foundational so they're not external they're effects and instead of trying to price them back into a concern we should put them at the center of regulation stop killing rivers by pouring pollution into them we need to to put ecological sense at the center of our understanding and of our regulations the city of amsterdam let me return there a moment by 2030 there will be no fossil fuel vehicles in the city and from 2025, no fossil fuel boats in the canals. So if you want to be in the, wor the world of mobility in the city of Amsterdam, you already know that by 2030, you've got to get well out of fossil fuels. That kind of clear commitment 10 years in advance sends a signal to industry today. They don't wait until 2030. They're already redesigning. They're already. And you can see when you go to Amsterdam, every time I go there, there's just more electric innovation, scooters, more public transit, more innovative ways of getting around. So bringing forward that future with a clear regulation. And I, you know, why leave it and say you can keep buying fossil fuel cars until 2035? Why are we dragging our feet with fossil fuels for so long? Give a long, loud legal message to industry that actually makes transformation start happening today. That, so through that clarity of regulation, I would say rather than trying to price everything in as an externality, I think the aliens will get us first. Yes, yeah, we'll get us then. Um, I, I think we have time, Kate, probably for, for two more questions if, if I'm quick. But um, I'll have to be quick too then. I, I hear what you're saying. I'll be quick. Thanks. I know it's, it's mainly me. From what, One question from Dara Lawler, who is our, a senior researcher here at the Institute. How are you, Dara? Dara commends your presentation and asks, how much complementarity is there in the ways that our economic indicators, for example, moving beyond GDP to measure economic growth and donor economics can interact? I suppose how much how, how can they complement each other rather than replace one another, I think, is Dara's question. If the, if the economic indicators are moving beyond GDP, I mean, I think so. So first of all, when you look at the donut, you, the indicators are natural and social metrics, right? Income mm -hmm. only shows up once and it shows up here around ensuring that everybody has a decent income to live on. But all these other metrics are either social metrics measured in human life terms mm. or ecological metrics. Now, of course, we need economic metrics. We need to also be able to measure, is inflation happening? Or we will want to know what are interest rates. We will actually want to know what's the scale of monetary activity going through the economy. GDP tells you what's the financial value of all the goods and services that were bought and sold here in a year. And that's what it tells you. It doesn't tell you whether they were cleaning up after pollution or uh, or, or an investment in a new health center and, 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 you know, early years schooling. So we want to know these things. And I think it's a really interesting task mm -hmm. to then say what kind of economic metrics will be in service of this world? Now, I'm very much focusing on these metrics first, because I think we have to land this. Yeah. And then invite the economic conversation, say, what kind of economics is in service of this? What kind of financial system is in service of this? If we if we start the other way around, we end up where I found my, the first 20 years of my career, begging at the door of finance, begging at the door of economics. Could you please recognize social value? Could you please recognize environmental value? And then you end up calling, you know, uh, trying to trying to price it, ecosystem service prices or social capital prices. I want to flip that conversation. I want to, I want it to start with the integrity of life on the earth, with human and ecological thriving. Invite economics to be in service of that. So yes, I think there is a really important conversation to be had. I'm going to loop two quick questions together. The first is from um, Joan Campbell. And Joan says, I'm not aware of any Irish university uh, that even talks about degrowth. Where can our children go to learn? And then... A question from Kirsten Dluick, and I think it's a nice question on which to end. Thanks so much for the inspiring talk. Could you share one application of the donut economic framework that you've seen has had a big impact and can be leveraged as a starting point or driver for action? Um, Joan's question, I would love to know where, where these ideas of post-growth economics and thriving economics are being taught. Um, 
and I know that students around the world are just frustrated that it's not in the curriculum that they've signed up for and paid lots of university fees for, but it is available, not in necessarily in, in institutions. You can find a lot online. There's a lot of online talks and learnings and lectures um, that are evolving. And I think we will see this coming through. If you really wanted that, I would say a master's degree in ecological economics is probably the most likely place that you'll find this kind of thinking being taught. Um, and then Kirsten's point, I'm, uh, can I show one big place where it's had a big impact? I'm going to, I'm going to resist that and say, no, I can't yet because this is really new. This work is really new. And I don't want to put any one of the places that's in action under huge pressure and say they've transformed because of course you could go there and say, well, no, they haven't, <laughs> they're, mm -hmm. they're trying. Right. And, and let me, and it's a good place to end. This is an urgent journey. And yet transformation takes time. Every city that we're working with is embedded in a in a region, in a nation, in a probably in a nation of re, region of nations that is part of the old system, and so they're trying to bring about transformation in in a much wider system that is pushing back against them. This is hard work, and you've got to stick with it, and you've got to have the guts and the courage to hold that vision. And what we're seeing is that the network of cities popping up whether they're in one nation or across them, the, the solidarity that comes between, the, the, the reassurance and the reaffirmation is very, very strong between them. So we need those to come up. Uh, and of course, there are examples within mm. them of communities that are using the donor as a principle. And sometimes saying, we're already doing it, but this gives a framework to explain what we're doing. Nobody understood what we were doing before, and I can explain it this way. So I'm gonna hold off by claiming great proof of some big impact, that's coming. But Good. until that comes, transformative journey ahead. Yeah, look, looking forward to have you in Dublin for Act 2 and we can discuss it. But I'll just be there. Really, real quick one, because I think you'll love this. Olivia Freeman has confirmed that NTU Dublin is doing this work. Fabiola Schneider at DCU, another one of the city's universities, says, as a lecturer in DCU, I can confirm that I mentioned donor economics as part of my finance master's module. So there you are. That's there a, you go. That's fantastic. That's a major citation. Um, Kate, it's been an, an absolute pleasure. I've learned an enormous amount and that's our mission at the Institute here to try and bring new ideas and, and understanding to people. So I feel really nourished and motivated to learn more about your important work. So thank you so much for taking the time and indeed thank you for your for your important work. I'll just Thanks. say as well for those, for those in attendance, so, sorry, Kate, I'm just going to say that th this fits really nicely into the whole series that we've done with EPA and I encourage you if you haven't had a chance, we had Professor Emily Schuckberg from, from Cambridge uh, Cambridge Zero who spoke in January. There's really nice overlaps between the discussions around externalities and other things. It's all on YouTube. I encourage you to find it. And I'll just finally, and then I'll hand over to, to Kate in case you'd like to say a final word. Uh, thanks very much to the EPA for sponsoring. Thanks to Keelan O'Sullivan for, for organizing one of our researchers here. But I should say next Friday, we're absolutely delighted. The next episode in the series, we're going to host Ian Gwilland from Zero Waste Scotland. That's at 1 p.m. on Friday, the 24th of February, chaired by Professor Owen Luce. I think it's going to be every bit as, as enjoyable as this meeting was. So I encourage you all to attend. Thanks again. Kate, the final word to you, if you wish. Just thank you for this opportunity and thanks to everybody in Ireland, whether in the city council or in local communities around the country who are just saying, what would it look like to make, make this happen here? Because that is how we collectively make change happen. So thank you. Great. Not much to end. Thank you, Kate. Look forward to speaking again. Cheers. Bye. Bye, everyone.